All right, guys, welcome back. Uh, today, we are going to be moving down into uh, some really actually very interesting topics. These would be considered core topics on the uh, CCIE routing and switching uh, lab. Certainly, they're going to be topics that you're going to have to be aware of uh, as part of the uh, discussion with um, the written exam as well. And um, so, we're going to be spending quite a bit of time talking about uh, these topics. I know it says about an hour and a half for policy-based routing and an hour and a half for IP SLA object tracking. Um, both of these topics can actually become much, much larger. Uh, that's our goal is to cover these topics today. But, uh, yeah, these topics can be pretty involved, uh, pretty, pretty in-depth. So we'll see how far we get with the policy-based routing um, and uh, obviously our goal for today is to finish these two topics and then uh, wrap up with GRE and IP tunneling tomorrow uh, so that next week we can start doing our EIGRP discussions starting with classic EIGRP. And you can see we have quite a few topics just with the EIGRP protocol, about 19 hours worth of training that we're going to have to go through for that, for that particular uh, lesson. So that's our goal. We're going to start with policy-based routing today. We're going to be using this topology uh, for the process. Uh, I put this topology into the Google Drive uh, under the chapter um, for this particular lesson. So if you want to go ahead and, and load that up as part of our discussion, we're going to have a little bit of introduction before we start to do some of the configuration. Uh, so you may want to uh, try to load that up so you can kind of play around with some of the syntax. Of course, you can also go back and watch the video and uh, uh, and and we're going to call this policy-based routing. All right. Uh, watch the video and kind of play around and pause the video and and go back and and play around with some of the configurations as well if you want to do that. All right. So basic EIGRP configuration. We've got an HQ location. We've got a branch location with some some PCs behind it. We're actually which are actually just really just routers. Uh, but we're going to be generating some traffic, setting up some policy-based routing on our branch router to define how the traffic is going to route across these WAN links and so on. So that's what uh, our first lesson is, lesson 17, which is our policy-based routing lesson. And then time permitting, we'll go ahead and I've already prepared lesson 18. We'll go ahead and get into lesson number 18 as well, uh, which is our EOT, our enhanced object tracking, and our IP service level agreements. All right. So what is policy-based routing? All right, let's get into my notepad here. What is policy-based routing? That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about how it works. We'll, of course, take a look at some different examples. Uh, I'm going to give you theory on policy-based routing, which should hopefully fill in all the gaps for the written exam. And then also we'll look at some practical application uh, on policy-based routing for uh, the lab exam as well. Now, we've already spent some time talking about regular IP routing logic. Uh, we talked about the forwarding information base that Cisco Express forwarding creates. We talked about the routing information base, which is our control plane routing function that exists within our router. Uh, basically, the packet comes in. The very first thing that we're going to do, as we mentioned before, is to do some sort of longest match routing, uh, where we're going to go ahead and match the packet in our Assuming we're not doing Cisco Express forwarding or any kind of fast switching, we're going to match the packet against the elements in our uh, routing table, which is our routing information base, and we're going to look for that longest match. Remember, we have that route recursion that takes place as well. We're going to route the packet to the destination, which is based on a next hop, uh, and then we'll use our recursive routing algorithm uh, to be able to identify the exit interface that's tied to that particular next hop. So the concept of policy-based routing is where we're basically making this an exception to the normal IP routing rule. And that's really what the goal is. Uh, so the, the idea of policy-based routing is this feature that we're going to implement, which uh, essentially gives us the ability to... Uh, identify data uh, based on certain criteria. We'll have a whole bunch of different match criteria. Uh, we'll, either, we'll, we'll match that information most likely through a route map. 
uh, before we decide to route the packet. The route map that we're going to create is then going to determine where the packets get routed uh, to the next device. Policy-based routing is really a, a way for us to override the standard routing process that might exist. Uh, now, we will find that this policy-based routing concept is going to be based uh, a lot of the um, information that we see with policy-based routing is going to be based on uh, the iOS version that you have or the, uh, uh, the, pa the uh, platform that you're using in that particular case. Um, but in any event, it is literally an exception to our normal IP routing process. All right. Decisions could be based on the destination IP address, the source IP address. We could look at some other upper layer information like, uh, uh, you know, is it uh, based on a specific TCP port number? Is it based on a particular UDP port number? We could even classify based on incoming interface or outgoing interface, excuse me. So we classify traffic using a route map. Uh, and then we're going to create that route map. In fact, let me put this down here. Classify traffic based on a route map that we create. So the process is pretty, pretty straightforward. We will define the traffic class based on um, either some sort of access uh, list or maybe a prefix list. We don't usually use those too much in policy-based routing or some other classification mechanism. Classification mechanism. I should not use such large words when I'm typing here. Um, usually it's going to be some sort of ACL. All right, because the ACL is going to give us all the flexibility we need to match on uh, static elements like the source IP, destination IP, source port, destination port, and so on. Um, and then once we've classified the traffic, we go ahead and we create a route map. And a route map is essentially a sequence of clauses. Uh, and we'll, we'll take a look at some examples as we go through the process here. I was just teaching this yesterday, as a matter of fact, in my CCMP class. Uh, and we were actually kind of playing around with a lot of different things. And I'll show you guys a lot of those things. We could spend hours and hours and hours talking about all the different match conditions and all the different set conditions. Uh, that's not the, the purpose of the scope here. All right. The purpose of the scope here is to be able to identify the basic functionality that you guys are going to need to know for um, you know what's going to be covered on the on the written exam, but also what you're going to have to know and be able to recreate or troubleshoot on the on the lab exam. So we have these sequence of clauses. Now, first thing you need to know about a route map uh, is that the actions for the route map, what we call the clauses themselves, is either going to be a permit or deny. All right, so a permit means uh, essentially that we are going to perform the action specified. Uh, and again, the action could be a lot of different things. It could be marking uh, QoS values. It could be changing uh, metrics for routing protocols. It could be changing the actual routing process. Uh, maybe like setting a next hop or something like that. A deny means we do not perform an action. Uh, now that might seem kind of silly. It'd be like, well, why would you put a deny in a route map if you're not going to perform an action, then just don't include it. But this would become for something like redistribution. If we want to apply a route map to say, I'm not going to redistribute these individual routes, uh, or it could be you know, for filtering, uh, routes or whatever. So there's lots of reasons why you might decide to put a deny action. All right. The other thing uh, it, to keep in mind is that the deny uh, deny does not mean that traffic is going to be blocked. Uh, that traffic is blocked. 
meaning that if, for example, I have a policy in place where I'm going to do some routing, uh, and I'm using a policy-based routing policy to override the normal routing procedure, okay, because I'm denying traffic from being policy-based routed does not mean that that traffic is not going to be routed. It simply means it's not going to be policy-based routed. So we're going to use, uh, in, in the case of uh, this uh, process, uh, I should separate this a little bit because this is step one, usually step one. Oops, what the heck's going on there? So this is usually uh, step one of the process. Uh, and then step two, would be uh, to go ahead and create your route map. So what I'm saying is uh, we, we can use lots of match conditions, uh, allow us to match on many things. And when we go through the command line part of this process, I will give you guys some information about how that works and what kind of match conditions we can match against. But it doesn't actually have to be an access list. We could match directly in the route map to different types of conditions. Uh, and then we use set conditions uh, to change whatever it is we're trying to change. I'm just going to say things right now because, I mean, you could do a set IP default next hop. You could do a, a set interface or set default interface. There's lots and lots of things that you can, you can set. You can set QoS markings uh, and so on. What kind of conditions you can set? Uh, highly uh, and and what kind of match conditions you have is highly dependent on the platform and the iOS all right uh, different uh, platforms and different iOS images especially if you're dealing with like XC versus XR software or you're dealing with um, a situation where you have say for example um, uh, we'll go back to that in a minute but let's say for example that you have a situation where you're dealing with 12.2 versus 15 whatever uh, you may see that some of the things that you can do in one version of iOS you can't do in other versions of iOS all right now the way that we verify typically this concept of policy-based routing is to uh, to run debugs we can do show commands as well uh, but we verify typically with well there's some basic show commands and I'll show you what those are uh, and with uh, a debug for example like the most common debug would be like um, a debug IP policy all right uh, be careful with that particular debug because um, it, it will show you whenever policies are going to be matched uh, but it's going to be a pretty robust output. It's going to give you a lot of information. Uh, we can also apply uh, policy-based routing in two different locations. And this is really important to understand. We can apply it on um, incoming uh, traffic based on an interface, based on uh, the link level, if you will. Uh, so we're matching against traffic coming into an interface uh, and that command would be something like IP policy and again we'll see this as we go to our command line stuff IP policy route map uh, my map or whatever whatever we call the route map so that'd be your interface configuration command but you can also apply uh, PBR globally all right um, and uh, when you're applying it globally it would be IP uh, local, uh, what is the syntax? IP local policy route map my map. Okay. Uh, keep in mind the interface based policies. First of all, when you're applying policies to an inbound interface, uh, well, to any interface, the, the policy is always going to be implied, um, uh, implied that it's inbound traffic only not outbound traffic okay so uh, notice I did mention their incoming traffic based on the link level you can't apply a policy based on um, uh, outbound flows because we're actually I've already done routing at that point kind of makes sense right um, so we've already applied routing at that point there's no really need to 
uh, to change routing because we're already at the link level anyway. The, the other thing about um, the global policy is uh, it affects how uh, the global policies are going to affect locally routed traffic. So this, uh, this, this applies to traffic uh, ba basically being processed by the router as a whole, but also traffic sourced by the router itself. Uh, and so if you're doing a trace route, for example, from the local router, how am I going to treat that trace route based on a certain IP address? Just be very careful here because you can actually apply a policy that might break certain control plane uh, functions, right? So a hello packet, uh, uh, link state advertisements or whatever could be broken based on applying a, uh, a policy, all right? So uh, one of the other things that you need to be concerned with is uh, that you do have to have, well, depending on what your overall objective is, you're going to have to have certain match criteria that you're going to want to match in order for us to be able to uh, do the conditions. And like I said, we'll take a look at what those look like uh, as part of our process going through this, um, through this configuration. Uh, also, make sure that you don't rely on policy-based routing uh, as your primary routing function. It's a really, really important concept, actually, especially if you're using things like Cisco Express forwarding, right? Policy-based routing is done at the control plane. It's not done at the data plane. So you could have high CPU utilization doing uh, based on interrupts, meaning that you're doing basically process switching instead of of policy instead of uh, um, data plane switching. All right, there is a document that you can pull. Um, it's called the Configuring IP Routing Protocol Independent Features Document. I'll put it in the Google Drive for you guys if you guys want to reference that later on. It talks a little bit about those concepts. Uh, uh, some of the uh, and it talks about you know when to use policy based routing, when you should stay away from policy based routing, and so on. So we could match on all kinds of things. We could match on packet size, for example, if I'm maybe trying to send a packet, like a small packet over to a priority queue or something like that, or over a different interface other than uh, my normal interface, or I can match on uh, packet length, I can match on IP address. Again, all of this is gonna be really, really uh, platform independent, especially when you're dealing with things like Nexus, iOS, and iOS XE, all right? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, sometimes you can do layer four classifications, for example. Sometimes you might not be able to do those layer four classifications. All right, let me get a drink here real quick. Okay, uh, one of the commands that you can use uh, is a command show proxy view history or show proxy view sorted. Let me see if I can pull up that command on one of these guys here. I'm not sure that GNS3 supports that specific command, but uh, this is a useful command if you're trying to identify whether or not you're getting high CPU interrupts or something like that. Show proxy. Yeah, this one. The, the, the thing about the show proxy commands is, um, is that these commands are hardware based and this is GNS3 is, is an IOU or, or not uh, iOS on, on Linux. So we might not actually have those commands show p question mark um, but let me put those commands into the notepad here so uh, let's just say here to verify uh, whether or not your device is suffering from a high level of CPU interrupts uh, which is process switching. We can use the command show um, proxy view history. Or we could use the command uh, show proxy view sorted. Not that you need to know this for the uh, test, because again, in the test, you're not using real equipment anyway. 
so you're not going to be troubleshooting any kind of physical layer issues or, or physical device issues in the exam anyway. So you're not going to have to concern yourself with that too much. Okay. Um, but do keep in mind, there could be a lot of interrupts if you have a problem with your PBR configuration. Now that's not to say that you need to stay away from PBR altogether because obviously policy-based routing is something that, that does serve a purpose in our environment. All right. Just make sure you pay attention to the criteria. Uh, and that's another thing to think about too for the exam, guys. You're not going to have to know every single match condition. You're not going to have to know every single set condition. The objective or the, 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 what you're going to have to know for the test is primarily going to be based on mainstream configurations, policy based routing uh, to reroute HTTP traffic or or to route, uh, you know, source destination paired traffic out of one interface versus another interface. You're not going to be doing any kind of crazy match conditions and set conditions. Now, there is another aspect to PBR, which is setting conditions for things like BGP attributes and stuff like that. We'll get into that when we get into the BGP section towards the end of the actual program. Uh, but uh, so PBR can be used not only to influence how routing decisions are made, but it can be it can be used to influence redistribution processes, how metrics are set, how BGP attributes are either received or or sent out, and so on. So there's a lot of other things that route maps can be used for, uh, and and our goal here is really to focus on how route maps are being used for policy based routing. Uh, as opposed to doing some of those other things like with re redistribution and such and, and stuff like that. So otherwise we'd be talking about this for hours. All right. So uh, like I said, uh, you can match on packet length, you can match on, you know, interface and so on. Um, the normal routing, of course, is going to take precedence. Uh, we also might want to override that normal routing process. Uh, and uh, like I said, we're gonna, uh, let's in fact, let's go to our topology real quick because before any kind of policy-based routing could take place, we wanna make sure that our all of our normal routing operations are in effect. And that's actually a good point. If you guys are dealing with this on the lab on the exam or even in your production environment today, before you implement policy-based routing, before you decide to override whatever routing decisions a router is going to make, make sure that you take the time to verify whether or not your normal routing operations are functional. Um, so this is the topology that we're going to be using. We'll be using these two devices over here to generate some traffic over to the HQ device here. But let's go ahead and make sure that we have our... Um, standard routing functioning. This is just a basic EIGRP um, design. By the way, guys, you notice I got the little tabs to show up here. Uh, I didn't actually do anything. All I did was upgrade a GNS3 and uh, it started working. So maybe it's something that they fixed in the newer version of GNS3. Uh, but anyway, um, I'll just load up all these guys here uh, and that way we can get into these later and start to, to check some things. Uh, in the case of the notebook and the PC, it's really just going to be a router um, that is is acting as a notebook or a PC. So the first thing I want to do is I, I just want to go ahead and verify on my branch routers here, show IP protocols. So we're running EIGRP uh, autonomous system number one, show IP EIGRP interface brief. Uh, and we're running it on these interfaces here. Uh, brief is for OSPF, but uh, so it looks like we do have EIGRP functioning. Let me just do a quick show IP route, and we're definitely getting some EIGRP routes. So I'm going to assume uh, we'll do some troubleshooting later if we need to, but I'm going to assume that essentially everything is working as expected, and all of our layer three convergence is good, and we've got all our neighbors and everything else. All right. Uh, before we actually do any kind of trouble or any kind of policy-based routing, we'll go through and verify the topology and and verify how things are supposed to be routing. Obviously, we got a serial link here, we got a point-to-point -point serial link here, we've got a WAN link here, uh, and this is also the same topology that we're going to be using for object tracking and, and SLA as well in our next lesson. So, um, 
path control is part of that. That's why I named this one path control instead of policy-based routing because path control includes things like EOT and IPSLA. All right. So we'll take a look at that uh, in the next lesson as well. Definitely, if you have a chance to load this up while we're going through the theory here, that'd be great because uh, then you can kind of play around with this. But like I said, you can go back to the video and load up the uh, load up the uh, platforms and kind of run through the video yourself and play around with some of the settings yourself as well. All right. So uh, we classify the traffic. Um, like I said, we use a match condition to to reference those classifications. A permit means to do some sort of policy-based routing. A deny means to use normal fat forwarding. Uh, and you can see that we can we can match on many, many different conditions. In fact, let me pull that up. Uh, I'm not going to actually create a policy. I mean, I'll, I'll uh, uh, create a route map here just to show you guys um, my map, uh, permit 10, just to show you guys some of the match conditions that we can have. So uh, again, you're not going to have to know all of these. And, and, and in some other platforms, you might even have more conditions to match against. But you can see here that some of these are going to apply uh, to maybe, for example, a route type. So let's say I say route type, I'm probably going to get external type 1, external type 2. So these are going to uh, uh, maybe a DEX route or a D route or maybe an OE2, an OE1 route or a, a ON1 route or ON2 route. Internal routes like an O route or an OIA route versus a D route, uh, ISIS level 1 and level 2 routes. Level one is kind of an intern, internal area route versus level two, which is a backbone route. Locally generated routes, so that might be something that we would do in BGP, or we could match on uh, ON1 or ON2 routes. NSSA external would be N1 or N2 type of routes. So um, there's uh, all kinds of things that you can match on, and that's what I was really kind of alluding to when we were starting the process of configuration or, or discussion is that there's just a bunch of stuff that you can match on. And it's really not practical for us to go through every single example that, that might exist uh, in this, um, in this um, lesson. So I do encourage you guys to kind of play around with some of these different settings. Maybe go back and take a look at some of the different options. For example, I could do source protocol. Uh, and I could specify, is the route coming from BGP? Is it coming from EIGRP or whatever? Uh, whether you're going to use these in the real world or not, match on a route tag, for example. Um, the tag can be written in dotted decimal format, or we can create a tag list. So we could say, okay, if the route is tagged 10 or tagged 100, what are we going to do with this particular protocol? So the match conditions will vary. On the exam, most likely you're going to be looking at your standard match conditions. Uh, maybe you're matching on a path metric or a route metric. So um, the metric value, this is a generic value, uh, meaning that metric could apply to just about anything. If it's cost, it would be the cost. If it's hop count, maybe it's three hops or whatever. It, it really depends on what you're referencing in the route map as far as classification as to what how the metric is going to apply so let's say I'm, I'm matching, I've created an access list to match on routes that are coming in through RIP. When I do a match metric, it's going to apply uh, specifically to those routes that have hop count and so on. All right. Uh, now, the other thing I want to mention about match conditions, uh, when we're matching conditions, in fact, let me pull up my notepad here again. Um, some of the match condition considerations. Match condition considerations. Uh, number one, uh, what you can match on usually will depend on specifically how you're classifying the traffic. All right. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, uh, is it uh, am I using an ACL to match my RIP routes, or am I using an ACL to match my BGP uh, routes, or whatever it might be, or is it, uh, or am I matching against routed packets? 
right? If I'm ratcheting against routed packets, which is like uh, the client to client stuff, uh, then obviously uh, matching a metric is probably not going to be an option for me as far as, um, as, far as matching, right? So uh, when you're classifying the traffic that's going to get matched, the match conditions that you specify are going to be based on essentially how the traffic itself is being classified. In addition, you can do kind of a, what we call a match all or match any based on how the match statements are written in the clause. All right, based on how the match statements are written in the, in the clause itself. All right, let me explain what I mean by that. So if I do a match, for example, IP address, so I'm matching an access list in this case, and I do a 10 comma 20. In fact, let me show you what that looks like in the command line here. Match IP address 10 comma 20 dash 30 comma 50, right? So when I do something like that, and, and I think you can even my underscore ACL, yeah. So you can combine 100-101 or whatever. So when you're, when you're putting match conditions in a line like this, clearly in this case, well, I don't know if it's clear, but definitely something to know, we're doing a match or, all right? We're not doing a match all. So if you have match conditions like, here, let me just copy this line here so I can keep it consistent. So if I have uh, these match conditions, right? Uh, this is going to be a match any, right? Uh, meaning one or the other. All right. I didn't really state that very well, but uh, basically it's, we're not trying to match against all of those conditions. We're trying to say, okay, if the traffic is matched or permitted by ACL 20, uh, if the traffic is permitted by my, C my ACL, if the traffic is permitted by access of 100, then it's going to be matched into this clause. All right. The other option that you have is to do the match or. So if I have or, let me put uh, uh, match all, excuse me. So I could do a match uh, 10 comma 20 dash 30 comma my ACL. And then I might say, okay, let me go ahead and match also. Uh, let's do a, um, yeah, let's do a route type external. Okay. Uh, OSPF type two. So that means the metric is not going to change as it moves throughout the OSPF domain. So if I have a match condition that's listed, let me do a show run pipe section route map real quick. If I do a, uh, if I if I create this scenario where I'm matching against multiple entries within the clause, all of those entries have to match in order for the traffic to be matched into that clause. So, for example, here it could be access. Um, that's kind of weird how it showed up there, huh? That's really strange. Let me see if route map, huh? That is really strange. Uh, let's try that again. Uh, let's do a no match. I understand why the commas at the end, but why did it change that all to one name? Match IP address. You know what, um, 10, yeah, so I put spaces in, I mean, I put commas in instead of spaces, so I think it's it's supposed to not have the commas, so my ACL 100-101, let's see how, do show run pipe section route map, uh, let's see how that comes up. Interesting, interesting. So it looks like this particular code is not allowing me to do like ranges and commas and whatnot. 
So it took the 10, it took the MyACL, but it dropped out the 20 through 30 and the 100 to 101. So I could probably do a match IP address 10, 20, uh, 45, uh, my ACL, uh, 100, 101, do show run section route map. Uh, and in this case, it's going to accept all those. Yeah. Okay. So um, this particular code, I don't know if that's actually a limitation of this iOS or if it's just a general limitation altogether, but it looks like uh, in this particular case, we can't use ranges, right? We can specify individual entries or individual match conditions, but we can't use ranges. So that's kind of an interesting thing. And these are the things that you find out when you kind of play around with this stuff. So the same rule applies though, right? Because we're matching multiple conditions in a single row, these are OR conditions. This access list, or this access list, or this access list, and so on. When I have a second line, then that becomes an AND within the clause. So uh, if I'm matching vertically, I'm matching with a logical AND. Uh, and if I'm matching horizontally, I'm mag matching with a logical OR. Okay, just something to keep in mind. And I would guess that on the CCIE routing and switching exam, uh, uh, the written, I mean the lab exam, you're going to be faced with probably doing some complex um, conditions where you actually have to match on, on some pretty complex scenarios. So just the, the understanding the rules is really important in this particular case. Okay. Uh, now we've done a match. Now what do we do with the traffic? Usually if we're going to match, we're probably going to do a set as well. All right. We're probably going to do a set. Now I'm going to go back and review some of these things. Um, there's some more theory that we need to talk about. We're, we're certainly going to uh, uh, apply some of these things uh, in our topology and kind of look at stuff and how to verify and troubleshoot it. But there's still a lot of theory that we need to talk about. Uh, in fact, let me, let me kind of get back to that part of the process and, and talk a little bit about some of that theory um, that, that we need to fill in here. Okay. Uh, there are some prerequisites for being able to do policy-based routing. For example, you do have to, to be running IP base software at a minimum as far as the licensing requirement goes. Um, and uh, most platforms are going to be running that. All right. Uh, and, and we understand the, the, the need for policy-based routing and what, what it, you know, how it basically works. Uh, we're going to identify the traffic. Like I said, we're going to go ahead and put that traffic into a route map and match those conditions. And we're going to enable policy-based routing on the interface. That's kind of the last step by using the IP policy command. All right. Uh, now, the, there are some other things that we can do. Uh, we can enable policy-based routing globally. We can enable it using fast switching policy-based routing. Like I said, we can do local policy-based routing or we can enable it using Ceph switched policy based routing and and we'll take a look like I said at some different examples. All right. So what are some of the set conditions that we have available to us? Once we've done our match conditions, we now want to go in and maybe apply some set conditions to the traffic. Again, as always, uh, this can get pretty involved, right? As far as the set conditions go, there's a whole bunch of things that we can do. Now, uh, let, me, let me identify uh, maybe some of the common match conditions that you might see on the exam, all right? Because that's important. So one of the things that you might see, oops, I didn't mean to get out of the policy. Hold on. Do, 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 do. Oh, well, let me just do route map. And where is our route map name? Right here, my map. So I'm going to go back into that clause. One of the things that you can do is you can do like a match length, right? So we can specify the layer three length of the packet itself. This would be matching specifically against like the total length field that's actually in the packet header, right? Uh, you can also do a match IP address. Uh, if I do a match IP address, these are some of the common ones that you guys are going to have to be familiar with. 
I can specify a prefix list if I want to match against a prefix list. This is typically going to be used for like BGP policy based routing. Uh, we'll talk more about prefix lists when we get into BGP. Uh, you can match against a standard ACL or you can match against an extended ACL or a named ACL. All right, so let's say my underscore ACL and we can actually do again or conditions or this list or this list and so on or I can just simply hit a carriage return. Um, if you don't specify a match statement, let's say that I just simply, uh, I go into policy number, uh, 20 clause 20, and I just do a set condition, set IP next hop 1.1.1.1. So if I do a show run section route map in this case, uh, because I haven't identified any specific match condition this is going to apply to all packets uh, that didn't get matched from a previous clause. That's actually something I need to, to mention here uh, in the notes because it's really, really important. Uh, let me put it right here. Important, important, important. Uh, route maps are processed from the top down. Uh, and as soon as there is a match hold on uh, we apply that policy okay just like an access list access lists get processed from the top down and as soon as there's a match we apply that policy uh, and then secondarily also important there is an implicit deny at the end, deny clause, I should say, at the end of every route map. Meaning that if I haven't gone through the route map and I haven't, uh, I haven't included a permit for a particular traffic, there's an implicit deny, which means that whatever policy I'm trying to apply uh, will not apply in this case. So it's not that we're going to deny the traffic, it's that we're just going to deny um, the policy being applied to that traffic. Uh, Chris has a question here. It says route maps take precedence over dynamic uh, or static routing. Yes. Uh, route maps are, are is something that you are doing uh, to override whatever other policy you might have in place. So a route map is always going to take precedence as long as the packets match the appropriate route map is always going to take precedence over any kind of IGP protocol or BGP or even static routing. Uh, and that's really kind of the point. You're trying to make it so that you're overriding the default routing information based behavior or in, in the case of applying route maps to Ceph, uh, forwarding information beha based behavior for, for Cisco Express forwarding. Okay. Great question. Thank you for uh, the question. I appreciate that. Um, now, as far as the set conditions go, so let's go back to my uh, previous clause. We're not going to use this route map. I'm just using this as an example. So I can go back to my previous clause here, and you can see that we have tons of set options. Uh, not only do we have tons of set options, we have sub options that are available as well. So I can set a tag for a particular route if I want to tag a route with a value. Um, I can set the level of the route. Again, the set condition, uh, so is it going to be a level 1-1 one, one route, 1-1-2, one, one, or 1-2 one, route, level 1-1-2, one, one, whatever. Uh, I can set the condition, but the set conditions are pretty generic depending on whatever you're matching against. So it wouldn't make any sense to set, uh, for example, a client-based routed packet with a level 1 designation because it's not really a it's not a route it's a it's a, a routed packet it's not a routing packet so the set conditions have to correspond to whatever your objective is for uh, based on what you're matching against so I could say set metric for example this is an interesting one so I could set the metric uh, value which again is generically applied or I could set the bandwidth in kilobits per second if, if, if it's applying to EIGRP or whatever. 
or I can actually increase or subtract from the metric. So I can play, say, plus three, for example, if I want the hop count to go up three hops. If I'm matching against maybe some sort of rip process, right? So again, maybe it's adding a cost of three. So maybe the cost of the link is 65, but I want to make the cost of the link 68. I can just do a plus three or I could do a minus three. Uh, to subtract the number of hops or subtract the cost. All kinds of interesting things you can do. So you can see how it can get kind of complicated. Uh, we could end up doing <laughs> a bunch of different things uh, to apply all kinds. Of, I mean, it's just, it, it's kind of limitless, really, what you can do. And it really just depends on what you're matching against uh, as well as, as what you're setting against as to what types of conditions you can or what kind of, kind of actions you can perform or what kind of conditions you can match against. So we could do something like set precedence, for example. Um, we, uh, sorry, IP precedence, uh, which allows us to set the precedence value in the actual packet header. So if we're trying to maybe change the classification of traffic, uh, again, this is where we get into the concept that policy-based routing does not only apply just to routing. Uh, it could it could apply to um, to uh, changing the quality of service of a packet. We could actually come in here and say, let's go ahead and set the um, uh, what else uh, the IP DF bit for example, right? So am I going to turn do not fragment off or am I going to turn do not fragment on? I can set the uh, VRF IP VRF if I want to set the VRF and specify the VRF instance. So I can change what VRF instance a packet's getting matched against and so on. Now, usually what we're going to be using with policy-based routing is something like set IP next hop, right? So that means we're going to go ahead and set the next hop to where the packet is actually going to be routing. Um, I could also do a recursive option as well. Uh, that's going to set the next hop where the packet's going to go if the hop is to a router that's not necessarily adjacent. That's a little bit more complicated. We don't typically use that one, um, but we could uh, you know, potentially set the next hop to a router that's not necessarily adjacent. I can also set the uh, interface, right? In fact, if I just do a show IP or set IP question mark, you can see there's, there's just a whole bunch of different options here, all right? Um, so we have a, a bunch of options. So Chris had a question. He said here, um, can you insert traffic into a VRF? Um, I'm assuming you're talking about like client-based traffic, routing client-based traffic. Remember, you can't really, you can't really force traffic into a particular VRF, but you could force traffic to route to other VRFs. So I could say, for example, uh, set, uh, set IP VRF. So if I use the set IP VRF command, uh, I don't, we, we don't really have VRF set up in our topology, so I won't actually be able to uh, demonstrate this. But if I, if I set uh, IP VRF uh, and I put in the name purple or whatever the name of the VRF is, and then I can set the next hop based on that VRF. Does that make sense? So I can say, okay, um, even though the traffic might be coming in on a global VRF, I could say, okay, let's go ahead and set the next hop of this traffic to a hop that's in the VRF itself, right? And uh, Chris said here, so you can't break into a VRF going over MPLS or VPN? No, you couldn't. Uh, it would have to be a VRF that's obviously local on that router um, because we're not going to be able to uh, identify maybe a VRF that a service provider is going to have or something like that. That's a great question because you do consider what could happen on the, on the provider edge router if we could inject traffic into a, a different VRF. Remember, all this policy-based routing is local to the router itself. Very, very important, right? So we're, you know, we're trying to uh, control how the local router is processing the traffic. So the, the VRF would have to be in that, in that particular local router. 
All right. Now, a service provider could certainly do that, um, but I don't see why they would necessarily want to do that. All right. So we could set, uh, for example, IP interface. Kind of getting down the rabbit hole a little bit here. Uh, set um, interface. Sorry. Uh, so we can specify the outgoing interface uh, for the traffic. Remember, we're not identifying an incoming interface um, because uh, we've already, and the policies applied to the incoming interface. So we're trying to identify how the traffic is being routed, which means it would apply to the outgoing interface. You could set the default next hop. So that's, a, that's one you might see on a regular basis. Uh, set IP default next hop. Now, when you're throwing in the, the next hop or the default option, so you've got next hop or you've got default next hop. There's a big difference here between these. When you're doing the default next hop, that's going to set the next hop where the route, where we're going to route the packet if there is no explicit route for that particular destination. So maybe uh, I'm overriding the default route in this case as opposed to a specific route. So I'm saying, okay, uh, if, a, if a packet is matching, uh, based on the, the match criteria, if, a, if that particular packet is matching the default route, I'm going to change the next hop for that traffic based on that match condition. Does that make sense? Uh, you can also do a set default interface. Uh, so rather than doing, it's very similar to like saying set interface versus set default interface. So we can do a set default interface uh, which is going to set the output interface for the packet uh, if, again, I don't have an explicit route for that particular packet, okay? Um, there's, there's really all kinds of things that you can do. Um, you can actually uh, kind of commingle some of these as well. So like I said when we started this lecture, it's really kind of out of the scope to go through every single element that you can do within policy-based routing. Uh, it's not out of the scope necessarily. It's just not practical for us to talk about every single aspect, right? So um, it, it's something that you really have to kind of do a little research. And it is platform and iOS dependent too, as based on what you can match and what you can do. So uh, for example, a Nexus is going to be uh, significantly different than say just a, a regular iOS or even an iOS XE uh, 16 or whatever code all right so make sure you do the research make sure you're identifying you know what kind of platform you're running uh, again it goes back to when we talked about in the, one of the very first videos of this course we talked about what kind of code you guys are going to see on the test so be familiar with uh, maybe some of the configurations but again on the lab you're not going to be doing any kind of crazy policy-based routing stuff. You're going to be doing some basic policy-based routing stuff. All right. So the next step in this process, uh, which is step three. So we did step one, step two. Um, let me see if I've finished this concept here. Or uh, let me fix this because we already determined that that's not going to work. Uh, let's see. All right, um, or you could do something like this, 2030, my ACL. And if I have a second match condition, match, um, let's see, let's pick one here that's interesting. So let's do a match IP and route source. Uh, let's do OSP, uh, no, let's not do that. Let's do, uh, which one do I wanna do? Mm. Yeah, route type is fine. Internal, and let's, yeah, just do that. So, um, I mean, that's not really, the, the point of the command is not what I'm trying to identify here. I'm just basically saying, okay, this is a logical and, meaning both conditions have to match to match the traffic, okay? Now, when I say both conditions have to match, the first one is an OR. It's kind of hard to represent this in Notepad, but the first one is a logical OR, but because I have two conditions within the same clause uh, on different lines, if you will, those are gonna be a, 
an and operation. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, now, if you wanted to do something crazy, like say, okay, uh, internal, external, uh, external type two or whatever, I'm not, I'm not going to keep this in here because it'll be kind of confusing. So if I was saying internal, external type two, uh, now we've got two different or conditions and an and condition. Now it gets really, really confusing because it could be this with combined with this, or it could be my ACL combined with this. Um, so oftentimes you might have to separate your arguments into different clauses to match different conditions um, based on whatever your criteria it is, whatever criteria it is you're trying to match against. All right. Step number three. Am I using numbers or yeah, letters? Okay. Step number three is uh, basically to apply the policy, apply the route map. Now, when it comes to policy-based routing, PBR, we're going to apply the map, route map by using an interface-specific command on the ingress interface uh, where we're trying to apply the policy. So it would be IP policy route map, my map, all right? And this uh, always assumes ingress traffic, okay? Always assumes ingress traffic. Uh, now, the reason why I distinctly define that is because you can apply a route map to lots of different things, to things like redistribution, you could apply it to filtering, you know, filtering traffic from neighbors or filtering routes and whatnot. Uh, so you can apply route maps in lots of different scenarios. And uh, uh, again, that's, you know, maybe it applies to maybe a neighbor relationship that you have with another peer. Maybe it applies to a redistribution process from going from from one um, uh, from one um, routing protocol to another and redistribution and so on. Uh, just keep in mind, enabling policy-based routing, regardless of whatever its function is, is going, uh, well, specifically if it's applied to routing, is going to disable the fast switching of all the packets that arrive on that interface. So if I go into an interface and I say IP policy route map, and I say my map, Cisco Express forwarding is no longer going to apply to any of the traffic that's applied to that interface, even if it's not matching a specific policy within the route map because all the traffic needs to be processed through the route map uh, for the purposes of verifying whether or not it needs to be policy routed or not. So just something to keep in mind. That's a huge caveat to, to doing policy-based routing. That's why we generally try to say, let's go ahead and avoid using policy-based routing you know, as a way of defining routing because we're, we're, not, going to, uh, we're not going to be able to um, do the, the fast switching. All right? If you want to define the criteria of how packets are actually examined, and if you want to see how they are going to be policy-based routed, maybe it's based on the match length or match IP address, uh, you can actually do this by doing a show IP cache policy. So let's do, um, what, I'm going to add a few commands here, but step four is verification. All right, and one of those verification commands, let me see if, I haven't really applied this policy here. Let me see if the word, it works anyway. Show IP, cache policy. Uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't actually have a route map applied to an interface, so I can't see the cache policy, but when we actually go in and configure our uh, route map for purposes of demonstration and verification, I will show you that command again so we can kind of see how that looks, all right? We're actually using a, um, an application called Media Trace in this particular case, and it's going to show us all the statistics and so on and, and uh, um, you know, of what's happening here. Remember, and I, again, I keep saying this, but it's really, really important. Um, Policy-based routing does not work with Ceph. Uh, and it also, well, uh, let me, there is a way to make it work, but uh, by default it doesn't work with Ceph. 
It also doesn't work with RSVP. If you're doing some sort of re resource uh, reservation protocol in, in voice over IP or something like that. Um, the, uh, the way that we can configure policy-based routing to interact with SAF and RSVP, RSVP is, um, is to collect those statistics and, uh, and create these interface tunnels and so on. We'll get into that a little bit later on. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, trying to think if there's other concepts that I want to get into. I'll talk about local policy routing um, and uh, some of the basics, but let's um, maybe start to take a look at some of the configurations and I'll get into some of the other details. Time permitting, I'll get into some of the other details as part of the process here. All right, uh, let me see. Um, I've got my notes here. I, you know, I always do these little notes because I want to make sure I'm going through this and otherwise I'd be jumping all over the place. So I want to make sure that I've, I'm kind of going in the right uh, order here to make sure that we've got everything identified correctly. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the other commands that will run as part of the verification process is um, uh, debug IP policy. Now you can also do like a show policy map and show route map and stuff like that. Uh, debug IP policy um, tells us about, um, you know, what we're essentially in real time, what's matching a particular policy. You can do a show IP policy if you want to do a show IP policy. I don't believe that's going to show me much here. Uh, yeah, because again, I haven't applied this route map. If I do a show route map, we can see that the route map is created. Uh, we've got uh, a match clause in sequence number 10. It's matching an access list, uh, uh, any of these access lists, and a route type, uh, external type 2 and internal. So in this case, we're actually matching two different. So this is a match or, this is a match or, and th these together are match and. Uh, and then we're setting the metric to minus three. We can see that zero packets and zero bytes have matched this policy, which makes sense because we haven't applied the policy. And then sequence 10, we have no match clauses, so we're setting the IP next top. So essentially what's gonna happen is we're gonna go through the first clause here and whatever we're matching against um, is going to be matched into this clause and we're gonna do that. Once the traffic has been matched against this clause, we do not process it against the next clause. It's kind of like an access list. Once traffic has matched a particular clause, um, we don't continue to try and process it against other clauses in the, in the route map. We're simply going to do whatever that clause says and stop processing the packet through the rest of the route map. If the traffic doesn't match the first sequence, then we will go ahead and process it through the next sequence and the next sequence and the next sequence until we've finally gotten to the point where we're done processing data through the through the route map okay so uh, just something to uh, to think about from the, the you know the kind of the, the concept of top-down processing so show IP policy show route map and debug IP policy uh, or pretty much the primary commands that we're going to use to verify whether or not a packet is matching a particular policy. All right, because I haven't applied this policy to my traffic yet, we're a little bit limited in what we can take a look at, but we will, we will definitely uh, do that as part of our configuration here to kind of wrap up our discussion. Um, there are a couple of thing, other things I do want to talk about, some more theory towards the end, but I want to definitely get out all the basic route map concepts before we get to the actual um, theory, okay? Uh, the final theory elements that I want to talk about. Think about the rules when you're actually routing. Uh, we talked in one of our last lessons about what the effect essentially is of, you know, routing to a next hop versus routing to an exit interface. If you have a policy, for example, that sets an IP next top, that's usually pretty good because especially if it's a multi-access network and you're setting the next top for that multi-access network, you wanna make sure 
that you're not doing a bunch of ARP requests or you're not building that ARP cache like we saw in, that, uh, in our last lesson by using an exit interface. If it's a point-to-point -point link, that's, that's fine. In fact, I think, let me see if it will give me a warning here or an error. So let's say um, config t, go away, all right? Uh, and let's go back into our route map. Uh, let's see, I'm lazy, I don't wanna type it in, so I'm just trying to find the route map. I could have typed it by now at this point. <laughs> there we go. So let's say I'm going into, let's go into clause 30 here. All right, and let's just match uh, IP address uh, 1000. Uh, and we're gonna set uh, the interface. And you know, I have lots of choices here. Uh, let's say I set the interface to, um, I don't have any DMVPN set up on this router here. So uh, let's set the interface to an ethernet uh, interface. Um, let me do a quick show IP interface brief. So let's set the exit interface to uh, Ethernet 1.0. All right. All right. So you'll, you'll see this here. It gives me a warning. First of all, I didn't verify whether or not the interface was even active. That's the other thing about policy-based routing is that uh, policy-based routing doesn't actually go through and verify the operation or, or the, as you're entering the commands, it doesn't actually go by and verify whether or not what you're pointing to is valid or not. But it did give me a warning. It says, use point-to-point -point interfaces for route map set interface clause. And the reason it's saying that is because if I've set the interface to Ethernet 1.0, every single time a packet is going to get matched against this clause and get set to that destination, what's going to end up happening is I'm going to have to do an ARP request. We saw that in one of our last lessons, right? Where the ARP cache is going to get massive and, and I might actually have even incomplete entries in the ARP cache for that particular reason. All right. So uh, just something to keep in mind. Uh, now, if I did a set interface serial, mm, serial two zero, it wouldn't give me that warning because that's a point to point circuit. All right. Uh, you can really break things if you don't apply conditions correctly. Uh, so just be very, very mindful of that. All right. You can also break the loop prevention mechanisms that routing protocols have built into them, like split horizon or poison, you know, uh, or even just, uh, you know, the concept I'm never going to advertise a route out the same interface, uh, or even just in general, any kind of route uh, management process. So policy-based routing is kind of like static routing in that if you're creating a policy, the router is going to do whatever that policy is, even if it breaks the rules of the underlying IGP. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, there's a lot of intricate intricacies of this uh, these configurations, as we've already kind of seen. Quite often, you'll run into a scenario where the actual configurations are not documented. So that means that um, that you might be able to configure some sort of policy-based routing policy that doesn't relate to a uh, something that you would see in Cisco documentation. So just keep that in mind. A lot of times you just kind of have to play around with it, uh, especially if you're setting up a pretty complex policy. You're just going to have to play around with it and see what works and what doesn't work and kind of evaluate the outcome of what it is that you're doing. All right. So um, let's, uh, well, let's, we're going to go ahead and apply some of these concepts. Uh, I think you guys already have a pretty good idea of how this policy-based routing stuff works. Um, let's say, for example, uh, oh, here's another thing to keep in mind, okay? So if you look at our topology here, let's say that I, I did, in fact, set, uh, maybe it's traffic coming from this PC, and for this PC, I want to make sure that that traffic goes over this Ethernet-based WAN link, okay? If I'm setting the, the policy to send the traffic out the exit interface, 
and that exit interface goes down, the router's smart enough to know that that interface is not available and we won't policy route that traffic. All right. Uh, in fact, let's let me let me demonstrate this. So let's say that I'm coming from the PC. Let's let's grab a an I address on the PC. Show IP interface brief. All right, and uh, we've got uh, this address here: 192.168.110.20. Okay. Now, if I ping 192.168.100. Let's go to see what that is on the HQ router. Show IP interface brief. So um, my loopback is 100.1. So I'm going to ping, uh, actually I'm going to do a trace route real quick to uh, 192.168.100.1. And we can see that we're going, uh, looks like we're going to 110. If I look at my topology, uh, the 110 subnet hmm let me go back to HQ and see where that is 110.1 let me check something real quick uh, 110 oh never mind that's silly all right so obviously that's gonna be this guy here uh, so that's this subnet here uh, but then we're, we're going out uh, to the 10 network. That makes sense. Okay. Sorry about that. Lost my train of thought there for a second. Yeah, obviously we're going to hit the, the, the local branch router first. Uh, I was thinking this is a, this is the router. This was the branch router, but this is actually the PC. So we got another hop to go before we can get there. All right. So we are using the 10, 10, 10 link. All right. And uh, based on our topology, that kind of makes sense. These are serial links and that is a uh, that is an Ethernet link. So based on EIGRP bandwidth and routing characteristics. So let's go ahead and set up a quick policy that says let's take that PC traffic and based on source address and destination address, let's send that traffic out serial to one. Okay. So the first step uh, is, well, the first thing you need to identify is where am I going to apply this policy? I'm going to apply this policy in BR1. So let's go into BR1. Uh, let me do a show route map real quick. Okay, we don't have any route maps here. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and type config t, IP access list, uh, and in this case, uh, we're going to do an extended ACL, and let's just say PC to loopback. All right, and I'm going to say permit, and again, what you decide to match on completely depends on what it is you're trying to achieve. In this case, we're going to do all IP traffic from host, uh, and I can't remember all these dang IP addresses. So it's going to be from this address here, okay, and to host, and it's going to be the loopback here. Oops, wrong place. Wrong place again. <laughs> I'll get it eventually. All right, to host, yeah. You don't put the word to in your access list. Okay. So we're going to permit all IP traffic from that host to that host. Um, and uh, so that's our match condition. I mean, that's what that's how we're classifying the traffic. OK, now we're going to create a route map that says uh, we'll just call it uh, the same thing. PC to loop. And say uh, permit 10. If I could type correctly. All right, and then we're going to do a match IP address and we'll match the PC loop address. And we're going to do a set interface. Now, in this case, I'm setting the exit interface to serial 21. All right, serial 21. All right, now the only thing left is to go into the inbound interface on our topology, Ethernet 11, and let's go uh, ahead and set the policy policy route map and we're going to apply this route map to that interface all right so if i do a show ip policy you can see that i have the pc loop route map applied to ethernet 11 and if i do a show route map you can see uh, 
whether or not packets are matching a condition or whatever. Okay. Now, if I go back to my PC and I do the trace route again, you can notice that now the traffic is going over the 30 subnet uh, and the 30 subnet is this serial link. So it's hitting this serial link and then it's going to this serial link and so on. Now, what I was, the reason why, and if we do a show IP, uh, show route map, we can actually see in this case, oops, wrong router, go back to BR1. If I again do show route map, I can see that I had nine packets that matched that particular policy. So pretty straightforward, right? Create an access list based on what you're trying to qualify it against. Uh, set up your route map to match whatever conditions you want to match and then set your set conditions. Now the question that I have is what happens in this topology if the serial 2.1 interface goes down, right? If it physically goes down. Uh, will the packet simply be dropped because we can't match or we can't set the condition or will normal routing take place? So let's go ahead and go into BR1. Interface config T, interface serial 2.1, and let's shut that interface down. All right, now let's go back to our PC and do our trace route. And you will notice that because we had the exit interface specified in the route map, the route map basically knew that that interface was not available. So it, when it reverted back to the normal routing process. Does that make sense? Now, um, I'm trying to think of how I could demonstrate this concept. Actually, I know how I could do this. Let's go to a different scenario. All right. Let's go to a scenario where we have this Ethernet link across the WAN. Now, that's normally how we're going to route anyway. Um, hmm. Trying to think how I could do this. Hmm. Um, let me let me do one other thing here. Okay, uh, you'll see where I'm going with this in a minute here. Okay, so because this actually is a segue into our next discussion, so let's go ahead and turn on interface uh, serial two one. Do a no shut on that. Uh, all right, and uh, let me do a show IP EIGRP topology. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and trick uh, BR1 into thinking that the path um, through the 10 network is worse than the path through the serial link. So we can see that we can actually get to uh, that destination we're trying to get to uh, through do two different links. And the feasible distance of this path is 409600. The feasible distance of this path is 229.7856. So if I come into interface Ethernet 1.0 and I specify a bandwidth of a thousand uh, kilobits per second. Yep. Uh, let's do a show IP EIGRP topology. So it should, uh, yeah, so now we've made the serial link the more preferred path for serial 2.2, the more preferred path um, for this uh, loopback destination and this path becomes the backup path. So if I do a trace route again from PC, uh, come into the PC and do the trace route again, it should take uh, the serial path, right? It's actually going through, uh, let me make sure I don't have my policy still turned on here. Show route map. No, nope, I still got my policy turned on. Uh, let me do a show run section route map and just delete the route map. Uh, that's actually another point I wanna make. Uh, is um, if I do have a route map, no route map. If I have a policy applied to an interface, right? Do show run interface Ethernet 1.0. So I've got a, is that the right interface? That's not the right interface. Let me go back to my topology, Ethernet 1.1. So do show run interface Ethernet 1.1. I've got a policy applied to the interface, but the route map doesn't actually exist. It doesn't really break anything. It just means that the traffic's not gonna be, it's not gonna, we're not gonna apply a policy, essentially is what it means, all right? 
Uh, so it's the fact that the route map is applied and the route map doesn't exist doesn't mean it just means we're simply not going to it's kind of like an implicit deny all route map and it means that we're not actually going to uh, uh, apply any policy so let's go back to our PC and do our trace route again and yeah that's ex that's exactly what I expected to see 10 10 20 uh, so now we're taking this serial link as opposed to this link because the delay on this link is going to be higher for EIGRP because we've got 20,000 microseconds there and 20,000 microseconds there as opposed to just 20,000 microseconds there. So we get to learn all that in the next section when we talk about EIGRP. So now my traffic is taking this serial link because I tricked it to thinking that this WAN link is not, is not as fast. So I'm going to go ahead and create my policy. I've already got my access list. Uh, so I'm going to recreate my route map this time route map uh, what did I call it uh, PC underscore loop permit 10 uh, and I'm gonna say match IP address PC underscore loop oh silly me hold on exit no route map I gotta make sure I'm in the right router when I'm doing this all right uh, route map PC underscore loop permit 10 and uh, match IP address PC underscore loop and set IP next hop now in this case instead of doing a set exit interface because I want the traffic to go over this multi-access network I'm going to set the next hop to whatever this Ethernet 1.0 interface is on HQ. So let's go to my HQ router, show IP interface brief. So I'm going to set the next hop to this 10.10.10.1 address. All right. All right. Now you can always do a ping to 10.10.10.1. That's always probably a good idea. Make sure that you can actually have, you actually have network layer reachability before you set the next hop. But we're, so we're setting the next hop, which means now we should go over that Ethernet link if we do our trace route here. All right. Hmm. There we go. So that my console message cut that off. So now I'm using, again, the Ethernet connection. So you might think, well, wait, wait, why did you do all that? I mean, we already knew that you could do that, set next hop, but here's the point that I want to make. This is where you could potentially see a break in policy-based routing because the network or the link status of this interface is not reliant on, uh, or the link status of this interface does not indicate reachability for that next hop. For example, if I go into the HQ router, and I shut down interface Ethernet 1.0, the next hop is not reachable, but the link status of this router is still active. So Ethernet 1.0 on branch 1 is still an active interface. Show IP interface brief. Uh, Ethernet 1.0 is still up up. Now we did lose our EIGRP neighbor, so uh, the, the, the neighbor relationship went down. But again, keep in mind, we're not relying on IGP in this case. We're relying on policy-based routing. And policy-based routing does not verify necessarily reachability from a perspective of uh, you know, the, the underlying routing protocol. Uh, so if I go back to my PC now, what should happen is that the trace route will fail. Because policy-based routing is saying, the link status of the interface is up, uh, which means I have a local route, a connected route in my routing table on BR1 for the 10 subnet, but my route recursion is failing. So if I do a show IP route pipe include 10, you can see that I have a local route and a connected route for the 10, 10, 10 subnet, but the 10, 10, 10, one address is no longer reachable because the other side of the link went down. So you would see this in like an MPLS network potentially, like a layer three MPLS VPN, or you would see this in a frame relay network or any kind of network that has uh, some sort of, um, you know, uh, 
physical layer or link layer connectivity in between that's not directly related to a point to point connection. This actually brings us to the discussion that we would have in our next session, which is going to be how do I combine things like policy based routing with IPSLA or object tracking. All right, I'm not going to do that right now because I don't want to commingle the discussions. It's actually a completely separate lesson that we're going to be going through, but it's a really, really good lesson. Um, and I don't know that we'll get to it today. We're already at an hour and a half, and it looks like we probably got at least another 45 minutes to, to go through this stuff. But um, I'm hoping to get to it today, but absolutely we'll definitely do it tomorrow um, if we don't get to it today. Could you do, Chris has a question here, uh, could you do a secondary next hop? Uh, you, you can't necessarily do a secondary next hop because once a policy matches, uh, once a packet matches a policy, we do whatever that policy says. The only thing that you could do is combine object tracking with the policy. I guess I could do it really quickly. Um, uh, the uh, this is something that we're going to talk about in the next lesson, but let me just do it quickly. I'm not going to describe the, the configuration too much. Uh, so IPSLA 1, um, ICMP Echo, uh, let me see, 10.10.10.1, um, .10 .10 uh, frequency 10, um, and I'll just leave, uh, well, I could do the, the timeout of 2000, uh, oh, 5,000. Well, let me set the threshold to a lower value. Uh, let me see what's the lowest I can set it. I'll just set it to 1,000 and the timeout 1,000. So we have a, a second uh, time. I'll talk about, again, this is part of our next discussion, but I was going to talk about the differences between time, timeouts and thresholds and all that stuff. Uh, and let me do an IPSLA uh, 1 uh, and, uh, oops, uh, uh, frequency we did uh, yeah we did all that uh, and let's go ahead and schedule this IP SLA schedule one um, start time now lifetime forever and then I'm going to create an object a tracking object track one IP SLA one um, track reachability, let me see, uh, yeah, that's okay. I think, let me do a show IP SLA statistics. All right, so number of sequences, failures two. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. I got to turn the interface back on. Uh, so let me go back and do a no shot. And let's see, we should have some successes as soon as that interface comes up. All right, so the return code is okay. We got our tracking, so let's do a show track. Uh, do show track. Uh, IPSLA state is up and so on. So uh, again, I went through that quickly because that's part of our next discussion. But if I do a show route map, one of the options that I have is uh, set the IP next hop. And so if I go into route map, um, PC underscore loop, uh, permit 10. So I'm going back into that same clause and I can say set IP next hop. One of the options I have is verify availability. So I can say verify availability of 10.10.10.1 uh, based on tracking object number one. So uh, let me scroll up here. I think it was track one I created. Where's my show track? Yeah, track one. Okay, so that's how you could kind of incorporate. Um, so if I do a show track, uh, as long as the return code is okay on the tracking object based on SLA one, then um, then that and it's tracked by route map um, by this route route map zero. Hmm. Show route show route map. That's weird. Why it's calling it route map zero? But uh, um, yeah, so I'm tracking the tracking. Even right here, it shows me the tracking object is up. So that's I would have to take out 
that um, that command there. But that's basically how you would do that, Chris. Uh, so you couldn't, you know, once we match against a policy, we're going to do whatever that policy is. But again, part of our next discussion is is how do we do object tracking, uh, um, EOT, and IPSLA, and how can we co incorporate some of these concepts into some of the stuff we're learning now? All right. I did that quickly again because we're going to see that all over again when we go to to do that next section later on. All right. So uh, show route map, we did that. Uh, show IP policy, we did that. I mean, you could do a debug IP policy. I guess I could run that real quick just to show you guys what that looks like. Be careful with the debugs in the lab uh, because you can spend a lot of time trying to analyze, analyze a, a, a debug and it will, it will suck up all of your time. All right. But we can see here the packets coming in. It's going from this PC to this PC. It matched route map PC loop, clause 10, it was permitted. Uh, and then we can also see, um, let's see, uh, policy that the packet is now being policy routed to this interface, all right? Um, and we can see that over and over again based on our, based on our, uh, the, the, the multiple pings that are being sent out by the trace route, okay? Policy base routed counted. Uh, we are still using Cisco Express forwarding in this case based on the destination, but we're now sending that up to control plane, um, control plane uh, routing because we're doing the policy based routing for that particular packet, if that makes sense. Uh, so the debug can, can kind of give you an idea if you're matching a policy. It can tell you what clause you're matching uh, in this particular case, item 10 references clause 10, whether or not the packet was permitted uh, because of the clause statement, was it permitted to match, or were we permitted to do something within the clause, or were we were denied to do something in the clause, and so on. Okay? Just always think about what it is you're trying to do, uh, and the great thing about the policy-based routing stuff is if you build it piece by piece, you're more likely to have more success and test along the way. Uh, because you can always tweak the clauses or you can add additional clauses or insert clauses into the middle of the converse, into the middle of the, the overall route map to, to kind of change how things are going to run. All right. All right. Um, yeah, so we, I, I did demonstrate, even though I wasn't supposed, I mean, I wasn't intending to, uh, combining the concept of uh, policy-based routing with an IPSLA and enhanced object tracking, um, you know, tracking an object. But we'll get into that in more detail. That's a that's another kind of long discussion that we're going to go through as part of our discussion. All right. Um, so all kinds of things that you can do. Uh, what I want to do is part of the kind of the wrap up of this particular lesson because we still have quite a bit to talk about is um, you know some of the other concepts that that are involved in policy based routing right so for example what if I wanted to enable policy based routing with Ceph or or with um, uh, you know fast switching or something like that um, and uh, again this is going to be plat uh, you know it's going to be platform specific uh, but it just depends on, on what kind of platform you have. I don't think I really want to spend too much time talking about the fast switching policy based routing. I think I'd rather talk about local policy based routing and, um, and uh, Ceph based policy based routing. So we know that packets that are generated by the router itself are not normally going to be policy based routed. Uh, that means that we have to enable local policy-based routing for those particular packets. Uh, and we indicate that in the route map. And based on that route map, we use, um, you know, again, match on whatever conditions that we need to match on. So rather than going into, and I'm not going to create one necessarily. I'm just going to show you how it's kind of applied. So rather than going to an interface and applying the policy-based routing on the interface, we just do IP local policy and then apply the route map to that. Uh, let's do my map again, my map one uh, in this case. All right, so that's the route map that's going to be used for that local policy based routing. 
all the packets that now originate on this router are going to be subject to that policy. So it could be EIGRP hello packets, it could be CDP um, uh, frames, it could be uh, uh, trace routes and pings that originate from this particular platform and so on. To verify this, I would just do a show IP local policy instead of show IP policy. And that will allow me to verify whether a local policy is, is being, made, is being uh, represented. As far as what you can match on, and as far as uh, the conditions, that really is pretty much the same. Again, it depends on what, you know, what your overall objective is and, and so on. All right. Uh, with regard to Ceph switching, uh, this actually was something that was introduced quite some time ago in, in 12.0, I believe, uh, where policy-based routing is supported on uh, the Cisco Express forwarding switching path. Uh, Ceft switch policy-based routing is obviously going to have a much better performance than even fast-switched or, or process-switched um, uh, pro uh, uh, routing. So it's definitely an optimal way of performing your policy-based routing on the router. There's actually, um, believe it or not, no special configuration that's required in order to enable Ceph switch policy-based routing. It's on by default as soon as you enable Ceph and policy-based routing on the router. So those uh, arguments that I gave you guys uh, before, assuming Ceph is enabled, uh, don't necessarily apply in this particular case, uh, uh, where I said, you know, policy-based routed packets are always going to be process switched. Uh, that's was the case prior to 12.0, but isn't really the case anymore. In fact, if I go into the router here and I do an IP route cache policy, sorry, uh, not IP route cache policy. What's the dang command? Uh, let's see. I'm trying to show IP routecast policy I guess that would work show IP oops show IP can't type what was the dang command I'm trying to think of the stupid command uh, I thought it was show IP routecast policy Hmm. I might have to look this one up. Hold on one second. So, uh, yeah, I mean, um, did a little quick research there while I paused the video. Uh, the IP route cache Ceph policy is for fast switching, uh, but with policy-based routing and Ceph, you don't need to do anything. I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure there's a way for us to identify. Uh, let's see here. We have a policy in place. If I do a show route map, uh, we have a policy that says set the IP next hop to 10.10.10.1. .10 .10 uh, actually, let's make it a little simpler. Show route, uh, show run section route map. And let's see if we can't associate uh, the Ceph database with, so config T. And let's get rid of this line, the verify reachability piece. All right. Show IP Ceph. And let's see if we see anything related to the policy here. So I'm saying if it's coming from a specific host and it's going to a specific host, we're setting the next hop to 10.10.10.1. Uh, and you know what? Uh, as I'm talking myself through this, I am... Uh, uh, <laughs> When we get to the Ceph forwarding information base, we're already making a decision. We've already made a decision on what interface the data is going out of. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I completely kind of, I try to commingle those concepts. We're, we're, remember in the last lesson, we talked about the three things that a router does with data. It routes the data. It switches the data and then it encapsulates the data. Well, policy-based routing is just a different way to do the routing piece. So Ceph would still apply regardless of whether or not we're doing 
policy-based routing based on a routing information base, which is a routing table, or we're doing policy-based routing based on APBR policy. So it actually makes perfect sense that Ceph is going to work just fine with, um, with policy-based routing because we're already going to the switching concept. So in my policy, I'm saying we're going to send the packet to 10.10.10.1, uh, but I've already got an entry in my... Uh, in my um, in my database uh, for the 10 10 10 1 network right for the 10 10 1 host so 10 10 10 1 is attached to Ethernet 1 0 and we know that because of this the prefix that's assigned to the interface so the routers are already building this information ahead of time because of the configuration of the router itself 10 10 10 30 is attached to Ethernet 1 1 which means that these network addresses are going to be attached to that prefix uh, to those interfaces as well because they're part of the, the, the slash 30 prefix, if that makes sense. So it's a little bit silly, actually, to think that uh, policy-based routing would not be uh, something tied to Ceph because Ceph is post-routing anyway, if that makes sense. All right. So uh, let me see if there's anything else that I want to mention. Before we wrap up this lesson, uh, let me, where's my cursor? There it is. Uh, no, I don't want to do any configurations. I think that's about it, guys, um, other than some, some different examples that we could go through. But like I said, we could, we could do hundreds and hundreds of different examples and kind of look at all the different conditions. Um, the Trying to think if there's any... Anything else I want to demonstrate that might be unique to what you might see on the exam? And I can't think of anything. All right. So, so what's a takeaway from this particular lesson? Uh, obviously, we have our notes here. I'll save these notes into the into the Google Drive for you guys. But uh, um, uh, you know, as far as the actual referenceable configuration, I'll, I'll refer you guys to the video to go back and take a look at that. But I would encourage you to maybe play around with some of the possible um, options that you have with with policy-based routing uh, not policy-based not route maps because again we're, we're talking specifically about routing we're not talking about route maps in general so play around with it uh, play with some of the settings just be really familiar with what some of the impact of the different settings might be for matching and then setting conditions and um, and that's it all right so we'll wrap up this lesson we'll go ahead and stop the recording